Okay, with this patient, we are two months uh, post uh, surgery for a ruptured uh, patellar tendon. Um, so the first um, thing that we did was to reestablish a range of motion, which was done very, very quickly uh, by using uh, pails, uh, progressive angular isometric loading. What we found post-surgically is that the number one restrictor was the neurological tightness imparted by the increased neural drive um, going to the muscles. So we couldn't release any of the capsular restriction until we dealt with uh, the increased neural drive. And uh, one of the ways to deal with that is to utilize the, the PALES uh, system. So as you can see, two months post, we have almost a full uh, range of motion, which is uh, not a common finding for someone who's had a complete tear. So if you come in here now, now we're dealing with the FR release techniques. So uh, for this particular patient, he's saying that he's having a little bit of tightness underneath the kneecap. So what we're going to do is we're going to check uh, first, as we always do, we're going to check the interlayer movement. So we're going to look at the scar and find any restrictions in scar mobility. So I find that going superiorly, we have a lot of motion. Laterally, there is some block going this way. And inferiorly, I have quite a bit of tension. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to begin some interlayer treatment on the inferior scar, the inferior portion of the scar. Now we've done uh, some work uh, using interlayer release and we see that we have very good superior mobility, our lateral mobility has improved and our inferior mobility is also uh, highly improved. So now we've dealt with uh, interlayer uh, scar release. Now I'm going to go and see if we can find some intralayer uh, restrictions by actually utilizing movement and assessing using our tissue tension technique. So I'm finding a line of restriction, capsular restriction along this area going in this direction, which is actually exactly what that patient has explained. So I'm going to take the person to the end range. I'm going to take my contact as usual. And I'm going to start to work that last 10 degrees of palpable motion. If I ever needed to improve or increase my motion, uh, we would then utilize a PALES technique. In the case of this patient, because he is, uh, I would say, intermediate level with regards to his rehabilitation, we would be using a PALES level 2. So I would have him, if I wanted to improve flexion, I would have him hold strong. And then I would push and hold against his leg for as long as he can sustain the contraction for. And then when he relaxes, I will take up the next 10 to 15 degrees of uh, available motion, and then I will continue to work along that line. Now, in some other techniques, what people do is they take contact onto that muscle, and then they go ahead and try to treat through an entire range of motion, up, all the way up to knee extension. Obviously, that's not going to be possible because you have an overlying gastroc. So when you're palpating and touching the popliteus, as we show in the functional anatomic palpation systems uh, seminars, when you have that contact, you cannot utilize knee extension to treat because the superficial gastrocnemius will pop you off. This is also a good example of why um, FAP is so important, the proper palpation technique. The popliteus muscle is not located in the popliteal fossa where most people think it is. The popliteus muscle is actually in line with the fibular neck. So in FAP, we use um, a reference structure called the soleal line. And from the soleal line, we can drop superiorly. We can layer through the gastrocnemius, which allows us to sink right down onto the popliteus muscle quite easily. And then utilizing rotational movements, we are able to treat that popliteus and not become layered off because we're using knee extension.